The knight, Max, wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind and another. His mother called him wild thing. And Max said, I'll eat you up. So he was sent to bed without eating anything. That very night in the Max's room, a forest grew and grew and grew until his ceiling hung with vines and the walls became the world all around. And an ocean tumbled by with a private boat for Max. And he sailed off through night and day and in and out of weeks and almost over a year to where the wild things are. And when he came to the place where the wild things are, they roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. Till Max said, be still, and tamed them with the magic trick of staring into all their yellow eyes without blinking once. And they were frightened and called him the most wild thing of all. It made him king of all wild things. And now, cried Max, let the wild rampers start. Now stop, Max said, and sent the wild things off to bed without their supper. And Max, the king of all wild things, was lonely and wanted to be where someone loved him best of all. And all around, from far away, across the world, he smelled good things to eat. So he gave up being king of where the wild things are. But the wild things cried, Oh, please don't go. We'll eat you up. We love you so. And Max said, No. The wild things roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. But Max stepped into his private boat and waved goodbye and sailed back over a year and in and out of weeks and through a day and into the night of his very own room where he found his supper waiting for him and it was still hot. This area is actually poverty stricken. Some of these children live with their old, old grandmothers. These ones depend on handouts from the mission, from the school, from the well wishers. 40% are orphans. Initially, uh, the government of Kenya usually gave, gave us little thanks for buying uh, books and especially the course books. But we never had enough for supplementary readers. These children cannot afford to go to a bookshop and buy any book. For the inspiring readers right now we have 1,200 books and we are very grateful. The vocabulary is growing. Their composition is getting better. And actually, even when they're conversing with you, they're confident because they know what to say. These books are of great, great help to these children. And as they read these books, they get inspired. They feel inspired that even tomorrow they have a future. Ghana, like so much of the developing world, is a country of contrasts. There is real wealth and privilege uh, here. 
no doubt about that. But there are also growing and massive discrepancies between those who have and have not. The harsh truth is that if you are grappling as the parents and the people who support many of these children are with the day-to-day -day business of putting food in their mouths, then the notion of putting a book in their hands is just totally beyond either your comprehension or beyond the possibilities of ever achieving it. I can't stress uh, sufficiently just how precious it is for a child in Jamestown, where we are now, for a would-be businessman in Kumasi, upcountry in Ghana, to have a book in their hands that's identical to the one that will be held by an infinitely more privileged child or young entrepreneur in the UK or anywhere else in a developed economy. It's about parity of value and esteem. And that's precious when you are facing the degree of disadvantage that many of our beneficiaries are. I've never not been touched in some way by what I've read. My first sense of an awareness of books was as a child in the Gold Coast, was my parents and grandparents reading to me. And I think emotional connection for children and books with people they love is very important. I believe books change lives because they widen and deepen not just understanding but the experience of life. Wherever you are, wherever you come from, whatever your background, whatever your reality, it's expanded and improved by the experience of books. Hello, I'm Louisa Symington. I'm delighted to be here today on behalf of BookAid International, the UK's leading book donation and library development charity. Every year, the charity sends one million books, brand new books from UK publishers to libraries, schools, universities, refugee camps, hospitals and prisons across Africa and around the world. In the second of our Books Change Lives talks, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Sir Michael Palin as tonight's speaker. Michael has written and starred in numerous TV programs and films, from Monty Python to A Fish Called Wanda and The Death of Stalin. He's written novels, screenplays, children's books, and history books. He's also made several much acclaimed travel documentaries. His journeys have taken him to the North and South Poles, the Himalayas, the Eastern Europe, and Brazil. Most recently, he visited North Korea, the subject of his latest book and TV series, North Korea Journal. He's also, as if that wasn't enough, published three volumes of diaries. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. I mean, what an amazing catalogue of a life, and now I'm going to talk to you about it. So I'm going to talk to you for I'm about... I'm very old, so there's quite <laughs> a lot uh, behind, behind me <laughs> yes. now. Yes, but most people of your age haven't achieved that much. I'm going to talk to you for about 45 minutes, and after that we're going to open it up for questions, if that's all right with you. Sure, yeah. Perfect, okay. And I am aware that 45 minutes is a short time to get through how much you've covered in your life. Um, so starting with Monty Python, um, now this was formed when you were incredibly young, I think 25 or 26, and there were lots of you. And I wanted to ask, what was the writing dynamic? Wasn't it terribly difficult? Well, we had got together because already we were kind of, um, we were in, in harmony, if you like, with our writing styles. Uh, Terry Jones and myself started writing comedy for the BBC immediately we left university so I was 22 when I started doing things like the Frost Report and Do Not Just Your Set. Meanwhile Cleese and Chapman and Eric Idle were at Cambridge um, and uh, we watched programmes they were doing like at last the 1948 show which is very funny and I think by the time we got together as Python we both, we, we'd all sort of respected each other as writers. We'd seen what each other could do and we felt um, uh, that it would it would work if we got together. Well we didn't know if it would work actually. It was a completely, yeah, we a complete shot in the dark. But it somehow harmonised and, and we were very kind of um, democratic to start with um, in the sense that um, 
uh, everybody was uh, contributed to each show. So there was no takeover by one writer or anything like that. And we shared out the material. Of course, we had disagreements about what worked or what didn't work, but essentially it was all about what was funny. And, um, you know, if you laugh uproariously at something, you can't then say, well, I'm not putting that in. You know, it kind of <laughs> sells itself. So there were certain sort of half in, half out sketches which you did have to sell and say, this, this will be funny when I do it or we do it. Um, and there was a little horse trading there, but generally it was amazingly comfortable, the writing process. Oh, that's so nice to hear. Um, I've got to ask you, what are your favourite Monty Python sketches? And I'm really hoping that the cheese shop is included in that. And could you tell us a little bit about how they came about? Uh, the, the cheese shop is one of my favourites. And that, that was a number of, one of a number of sketches which I uh, performed with Cleese. Um, because somehow the two of us, the, the, you know, the, um, the, the connection between us was he was the bossy one and I was the stubborn one and I drove him mad and so he went on, you know, usually shopkeeper, customer relationship. The bad, dead parrot was one of them. Um, but Chi Shop I particularly liked um, because it was kind of very pointless, but in a surreal way, rather satisfying that he knew every single cheese he wanted. And I didn't have any of them, despite being the finest cheese shop in the district. Uh, to which he said, we are certainly uncontaminated by cheese. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it was just me saying no most of the time. And it had a, a nice rhythm to it. And I've never been able to play that sketch with John without um, laughing at some point or having to control laughter at some point. So a lot of biting of inside of cheek to get through that one. But then I also, I suppose the one that um, is, you know, is it, it, pretty sort of idiot proof is, is the um, uh, fish slapping dance, which is very short, nothing much happens, very pythonic. And yet somehow every time um, people see that, they, they, you know, they crack up at some point, even the lady in uh, North Korea to whom it was shown. Yeah, she suddenly, oh, this is what you do back home. I said, well, not all the time. <laughs> I don't, I'm not slapped for a living, slapper for a living. Oh, that's wonderful. And, but where did the actual idea of the fish, I mean, where? where... <laughs> well, I don't know. It's really, it's like saying, where do dreams come from? Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. It's somewhere in our imaginations, um, some, something will come out. But I suppose, um, the shop situation is always a good confrontation, you know, and I mean, Ronnie Barker used it brilliantly with fork handles and all that sort of thing. Um, so you've got, you've got it all set up there. You can almost talk about anything there. The fish slapping dance actually came from, there was um, a, um, we, we were chosen to be the British contribution to a Euro comedy show, um, <laughs> which is a dreadful idea really, but we were. <laughs> And we decided to do a sort of festival in which all sorts of things happened. So there was dancing around the maypole and uh, you know, fish slapping was one of the ancient uh, British uh, um, rituals that you would see if you came over to this country. And to this day, um, apparently, well, not, not in the last few months, but up till that time, a lot of Japanese tourists came to the place where it, where it was actually filmed, which was Teddington Lock. Um, and, and they want to see where the slapping went on. <laughs> John and I could make a living just uh, sitting there, you know, with a hat on the ground. <laughs> Contributions welcome. <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful image. Um, now, one of the fun tasks of prepping for this uh, talk was um, re-watching some Monty Python, specifically Life of Brian. Now, my husband and 20-year-old daughter were rolling around the room howling with laughter, which is a rare thing that they both laugh at the same thing, I would say. Um, and Monty Python is still so relevant today, and it's more than 50 years since you wrote it. Why do you think that is? Um, well, I think we were not attempting to be topical or even fashionable. We were talking about things that were kind of people that move people all the time. I mean, that the... the the Holy Grail, for instance, was a sort of, it's a story which has been told and told for thousands of years, really. 
and we just we used it because we could all be knights and we could make up little adventures of our own and the same i suppose with the bible story i mean we we, we rather audaciously i suppose use that as the background but for to look at what happened in the bible story as if it had happened to the wrong person and how you get out of being seen to be a messiah and then that was i mean we did our research um, there was a lot of messiah fever around about the time that jesus was born a lot of people were looking for the messiah so the idea i think that started from that idea of something oh well, let's you know anyone anyone was a messiah at that time and brian happened to be the one on which we based the film but i think it was it was a, it's a kind of eternal not eternal but it's a, it's a it's a a, a well-known story a well-known setup a well-known set of um um you, you know of, of adventures and situations and so we were retelling a story that had been there for a long time i think and i suppose a lot of monty python is about human foibles isn't it and i suppose that they don't date perhaps no i, I don't i don't think they do i mean um that's the great thing why uh, it's nice to hear that children or younger people is a dreadful word, but that they, that they watch the life of Brian and they do and seem to get quite a lot out of it. In fact, just recently, I think it was in the last few days, the British Board of Film Censors um, uh, downgraded our, um, uh, our, uh, our censor, censorship category to 12. So now 12 year olds can watch, whereas before it was AA, which I think was 15 or something like that. So it was quite surprised about things are going in the right direction. But uh, I think also, you know, I was talking about you know, children in a rather patronizing way. Actually, they're extremely good audience for anything at any time. If the things they don't, really nasty things, they'll sort of tend to phase out. Um, and otherwise, they will look for they'll look for logic and they'll look for what's going on. And, and they will they were a very very good critics and have a very sort of clear idea of what they what they want to make what makes them laugh. So you know, I think the idea of censoring Python as they did in the first instance, the BBC puts it out very late at night to prevent children watching it. You're actually losing your your ideal audience. Interesting. That's very interesting. Okay. That's just my. Yeah, no, no, that's interesting. Um, now, diaries, you, you've kept a diary for over 50 years, I believe. I, I think you started one in 1969 when you were 25. Yes, yes. A six months old baby and trying to give up smoking, which seems absolutely phenomenally brave thing to do. Um, you published three, three of your diaries. Could you tell us a little bit about keeping a diary and why you do it? I think I've always been a list. Um, keeper. I remember at school I was very keen to make lists of things, whether it was stamps or places or deserts of the world or whatever. I always, I always wanted to write these things down because that, in that way I would remember these extraordinary and wonderful facts. So I kept lots of little books when I was at school about football, about um, you know, geography, whatever, and listed things. So the writing for me was, was um, uh, something that I enjoyed greatly and wanted to, you know, felt it was very much part of life to, to write things down. I was quite good at English essays where I was hopeless at maths and all that. And I, I did keep a diary very briefly at school, but then just, you know, life got too busy. And uh, <laughs> that's the thing is, you only keep a diary when life's really dull. When it gets too busy, you have no time. But in 1969, the, the, the sort of the inclination to keep a diary sort of came back and, um, very strongly because um, I was, as you say, I was trying to give up smoking. And uh, my uh, our son Tom was then a few months old and wanting to grab me and, 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 and leap on my knee and throw his arms around my neck. So I had to make sure I got the fag out of the way in, in, the, in, the, in the ashtray. And I did give up, I mean, almost cold turkey. And then I, I felt this great surge of willpower. Gosh, if I can give up smoking, what, what else can I do now um, uh, that I've always wanted to do? And keeping a diary was one of those things. And I started and I made very faltering pro progress. In fact, if you look at the early diaries, it's sort of the, the it's some, some quite nice stuff about Python and all that. But if I'd known what Python was going to become, I'd have kept a, a much more detailed diary. 
now I, 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 I keep doing it and now it's quite detailed actually. Um, and I've just kept going because you can't stop. Once you've got through the first year and you've still done it, you, you, you kind of feel it, it's much easier to keep going. And I do it in the morning, I write it in the morning. It's like getting up, it's like cleaning your teeth. It's something you do. It's good practice for writing. Um, I write in longhand, you know, an old fashioned thing like that, which I, it's good for keeping your fingers um, agile and it keeps your brain, um, it, may, it forces you to just think about what you did yesterday or the day before and how you would describe it. And I think that's a good, that, that's always a rather good exercise. And of course, it's extremely um, useful later on, you know, 20 or 30 years on. We've had court cases which have been, um, you know, my, my diaries have been read in court to uh, show what actually happened at the time. And not really, I don't think any of the other Pythons ever kept a diary. And they always say to me, oh, that's never happened. <laughs> that's, you made that up. That didn't happen to me that day. Um, but uh, there we are. I, I honestly, Gov, it was what happened. Yeah, fascinating. Now, you, your travels, your first travel documentary, I think was in 1980 with Round the World in 80 Days. And since then, you've been to the North and South Pole, the Himalayas, to name but a few. So what inspired this new career as a travel writer and documentarian? Again, it was something that had been there since my childhood, a bit like the, you know, wanting to write and wanting to describe things. I wanted to look around the next corner, over the next hill. And I, I was born and brought up in Sheffield, which was on the edge of the Peak District. So from our house and our little suburban street, you could actually get out on your bike in about 10 minutes to the most stunning uh, landscape, uh, hills, valleys, cliffs, uh, reservoirs. And you know, this, this sort of appealed to my imagination. And I think that geography generally, uh, uh, some people see it as a science. To me, it's something which is sort of a little bit more spiritual in that it, it's about your, your imagining, it's about this colossal world out there and you know, reading about places that you think you'll never see but are tremendous like in arms like the Gobi Desert or, or the Victoria Falls or indeed the North and South Pole um, and from very early on I was reading all I could about places like this I was fascinated by what was out there what was beyond Sheffield and beyond England and beyond you know Europe. Mm, fascinating absolutely fascinating and your latest travel, I think, has been to um, North Korea, where you presented a TV series and you wrote a book about it, the North Korea Journal. Yes. I mean, what an extraordinary country to visit. And I, I wondered, I think you also had your 75th birthday out there, which must have been quite strange. But what, <laughs> what surprised you most about the country? Well, I suppose what surprised me most was that it wasn't as dark and sinister uh, as I had expected. Um, I think I, I you know, was worried, mainly from what one generally read and heard about in newspapers, that you're going to a place where you may not even get out. You know, it's a kind of, it's a prison camp. Uh, everybody is um, suppressed. There's a sort of um, a military um, state of government there. But actually when you, when you get to, uh, North Korea, even bearing in mind that we were taken to places where they wanted to take us, um, the, the, the atmosphere seemed much more relaxed and people seemed much happier than um, I expected them to be. Not just the people around us, but people we saw in the streets and all that. I mean, you could tell, especially when we went to the north of the country, that things were very difficult and people were probably working for absolutely nothing. But in a, in a very very strange way this sort of love of the dynasty that has kept the country going you know after the Japanese invasions of the first half of the 20th century the American bombings in the war in 1950s and it still you know kept its um, its own sort of socialist ideals going and they've done a very good job of selling themselves and it doesn't seem to me to have been totally done at the point uh, you know, the, the, um, the end of a, a rifle. It seems that everybody has, has sort of bought in and in buying in are not having a totally awful time. In fact, having quite a good time, some of them. 
which you think, surprising. Did, did people know who you were? Was there a sort of, do you think there were many Python fans out there? Was it quite weird <laughs> going to a country where no one, did people know who you were? Or? Well, I actually, um, Louisa, I, I, when I've traveled, I, I prefer going to places where people don't know who I am. It's amazingly refreshing because then what I enjoy about my travels is that I'm observing the world and I'm looking at the world and I'm trying to learn from people. So if you go to a place where everyone says, oh, Michael, yeah, do, do you know, uh, do the Spanish Inquisition or sing Lumberjack song, then you, you, you cut, you're immediately on, you're on the back foot defensive. And I can say that North Korea, in common with the northwest frontier of Pakistan, are probably uh, one of those places where nobody knows what Python is or anything that I've done. Although, oddly enough, once I did the travels, you'll find people in very remote parts of the world who will have seen a travel program. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, North Korea was to totally sort of uh, recognition free. Um, there was no idea of me being a celebrity. They were quite interested in the fact there was a film crew there. But I, I don't think they associate this rather ancient man in the middle of it, so sort of <laughs> cutting away as being a celebrity. Because I've probably not many people in North Korea lived to the age of 76 or 75 as I was then. And, and you, you know, retirement age there is 60. So if someone who is still working 15 years after the statutory retirement age, is obviously mad or dangerous or being let out of hospital for a few <laughs> days. <laughs> Fascinating. And of all the countries you've been to, which, which has been your, your favourite one? Sorry, that's rather a sort of trite question, but... Yeah, I'm going to get a bit more light. Um, uh, well, favourites? Well, it's very, that's almost impossible to answer. Yes, that's all, yes. almost all of them. But I mean, there are one or two where I felt very happy when I've been there, uh, Bhutan is one um, because it's a beautiful country on the Himalayas and you've got the mountains and you've, you've got all these wonderful sort of natural environments which lead down to, to, um, uh, to the plain. So it's, it's beautiful to walk in. It's also they keep their uh, traditions going. People dress in national dress um, quite sensibly. The houses, are they care for the houses very much and the design of the houses are sort of a, an old design is still kept up. So they, they look after their country very well. And, um, and I was very, you know, that, that was just very easy on the eye and people were friendly. But people are friendly in, in most places. If you're friendly to them, if you're open, mm. they'll be friendly. Um, so Bhutan, I would say. Um, otherwise, it's just, uh, it's, it's rather difficult to, to, to say. I did enjoy going to Peru. But that was largely because we made the most extraordinary journey from uh, right in the south, um, Lake Titicaca, north to the Amazon. Uh, and I mean, that's right along the Andes, uh, past Machu Picchu, along rapids, and um, then out into, the, out into the Amazon basin. Uh, but it was a tough, it was a very tough journey along the headwaters of the Amazon. But in native villages where they were playing football. Um, only women play football there. The men just sit around and the women love playing football. They don't have any boots on or anything like that. It's barefoot. They half whack the ball around. And uh, that's where I was off offered a wonderful cocktail, which was a pink thing of of offered to me by two old ladies um, in this Machigenga village. And I asked what it was. Oh, it's, it's a special uh, palm wine they make just once a year for the festival and I said oh very nice I, they smiled so I drank a bit as you do be hospitable and then I asked a bit more about it and they asked a bit more and said oh yes well it's it's so important this palm wine that all the sugar crops in the area may may be destroyed maybe may be used just for this particular wine at, uh, at St John's festival time so I said oh that's amazing then there's a bit more consultation and the lady smiled at me and he said, my, my translation, oh yes, and in some places where there's no sugar growing, it's um, fermented by the saliva from the old ladies of the village. <laughs> and so I, and they were smiling and I kind of knew the inevitable answer to my next question. Is there much sugar grown here? Bit of talking, no, no, no sugar here. So that was where I had probably one of the most strange cocktails 
um, uh, in the world. I'll have palm wine but hold the saliva next time, I think. Um, now, as an, as an author and a writer, I don't think, apart from poetry, I don't think there's any genre you haven't written in. You've written novel, and you probably have written poems, novels, screenplays, children's books, diaries, and lately history books, uh, notably Erebus, the story of a ship. Um, do you find it d difficult, the transition from screen to page? Which, which do you prefer? Which sort of genre do you prefer writing in? Um... Well, I, I mean, I, ideally, right, I, I get more out of writing, I think, than if I was acting. Um, acting, playing comedy, it's a very quick buzz. It's, it's wonderful when it's right and there's nothing better than playing good comedy or, or just doing a scene where, you know, you get it right and it's emotional and whatever. And it, it's what, the, what the, um, the dramatist wanted. But I think the, the hardest thing, but the most satisfying when you, when you get it right is is writing. I don't think I've ever got it right, but I'm finding ways, I'm getting nearer and nearer to writing something that I think, oh, that's not bad. Um, so I, I don't find the transition very, uh, very difficult. In fact, uh, the problem is that I want to do both. And when we were doing our travel programmes, I'm there on camera and I'm also have my notebook writing down something that the cameraman hasn't seen there's some sort of sign or something out it and then someone says oh michael quick walk up that street and talk to that man in the market so i have to put the diary away talk to the man in the market and then i'm writing again i've seen something in the market oh michael get down there and you know, on, on board the ship so it's quite a it's quite a, a, a manic thing trying to get down the, the writing as we travel but very 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 important and then I have a chance to sort of edit it down and fill it out and make it sort of more precise and choose the right words for the book itself. So I get a, a, another bite at the cherry. Interesting. And with your last book, Erebus, I think you, you toured again, you toured theatres doing a combination of talking about Erebus and also about Python. Yeah. Was it was it strange being on the road again? And I was fascinated. Who were your audience? Have they grown older with you, or are you reaching new ones now with your travel documentaries? Um, it's often difficult to know who your audience are because you never see them. They just walk out on all these lights on stage. But it certainly wasn't. They weren't all people of my age, uh, or, or in their you know sixty plus. There were quite a lot of people like that who'd obviously grown up with me and the work I'm doing, but there were an awful lot of younger people in the audience as well, um, who, who, you know, had discovered Python somewhere or, or uh, were very keen travellers. A lot of travellers, even though they hadn't seen all my programmes, but they knew, knew enough about me to feel that I was somebody who um, they, they could learn about travel and they could enjoy hearing about travel. I mean, the same way as I would. When I was young, I would have gone and seen someone like myself and try and find out, wow, what is it like to travel on the Sudanese railway train <laughs> sitting on the top of the coaches rather than inside? Yeah, things like that. So I would say a, probably a mature audience, largely, but definitely some younger, younger people there. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Now, I, I wanted to talk to you briefly ab about books, as this event is for Book Aid, who supply books all over the world. Sure. In your travels worldwide, have you ever seen a situation where books have made an enormous difference to people's lives? I mean, well, actually, it's, I mean, it's a slightly, maybe a slightly marginal point, but we were filming in Mauritania which is you know nobody really know, know quite knows where that is but it's in west africa and it's a desert country and the wind blows and the sand blows but it used to be a very important trading route from uh from you know, europe down to um, what was then ghana and places like that so there was a there were a lot of people traveling across the sahara at that time and we went to what, two towns one was timbuktu and the other was chingeti and a very important part of life there was preserving these wonderful books that they had in these towns, which, had, I mean, were, were being stored in the most um, 
you know, unsuitable conditions. The wind was blowing, there was sand everywhere, but there were people who loved these books and they showed them to us, um, the Imams, and they very carefully showed us these very ancient texts, probably some of them 500, 600, maybe years, maybe even older. And it was something very moving there about the love of these books and how important it was. I mean, really those books should all have been in sort of somewhere like the British Library where it's temperature controlled and all that. And they, you know, probably that's what they would want as well, but they, they were there and they were caring for these books. And I was always very, always very moved by that. Um, yeah. Interesting, interesting. And during lockdown, obviously we've all been reading a lot more than, than normal. I wondered if there were, I know you said to me that you'd read a lot in lockdown. I wondered if there were sort of three books that you might recommend that you've been reading. Um, yes, there's kind of quite, uh, I'm reading quite a lot, but um, I was very um, taken with the stories of um, R.K. Narayan. I don't know if you know Narayan, he's an Indian writer. Um, and he writes in a beautiful Chekhovian way, really, about small town life in this place called Malgudi. And this, there's a wonderful story called The Printer of Malgudi, which is worth starting with. And he's just marvellous at playing with the little local politics and all that. There's a lot of humour, a lot of quite dry humour coming in. And it takes you straight into this busy, crowded um, little world where, you know, sort of, everyone's arguing with everybody else but it's basically it's a book of good intentions and uh and wonderful observation so rk narayan was a bit of a find um and there's another one which this is really kind of left out of left field it's called um the book of ebenezer lepage um l-e-p-a-g-e -E. now i was sent this because they were trying to uh they wanted me to um been a television adaptation of this book. I didn't know anything about it and I started to read it and it's all set on the island of Guernsey and it's uh, set over the lifetime of uh, someone born um, late in the 19th, died uh, late in the 20th century. And to start with I struggled a bit, I mean the, the, the names were sort of half French, half English, uh, the, the dialect seemed very strange and the, the the writer, um, a man called G. V. Edwards, had uh, very, was very concerned to make the di dialect accurate and all that. And after a bit, I got absolutely absorbed in it. And it's really, it's, it's just an amazing book, and it's worth keeping going. Um, I, I think you can find it; it's still around. Um, but the book of Ebenezer Lepage. Don't give up on, until you get, you know, give it till page two hundred and three. Um, because it is worth it. Um, so that, that, was, that was good. And the other one, the other book I read, which uh, was, uh, I thought, just wonderfully written, was, was called The Spy and the Traitor uh, by Ben McIntyre, mm -hmm. which is about this extraordinary man who I knew nothing about, who was a Russian double agent um, and working for the, for the British. Uh, and everybody knew about him, Thatcher and all those, you know, he was, he was absolutely indispensable to our intelligence plans, uh, this Russian, uh, and it's all really about intelligence, about espionage, it's about what it all is, how it all works, and there'll always be somebody spying somewhere. But he was, you know, by the skin of his teeth, saved at the end. It's a terrific story. Yeah, he's a fantastic writer, Ben McIntyre. Yeah, he? yeah. yeah. Um, and just going back briefly to comedy and sort of comedy now, I wondered whether you think that it can survive in the sort of politically correct world that we live in now. Is it is it much harder, do you think, now to be starting out on a on that kind of a career than it was when you were, or are there different challenges or and, and possibly what your fate what shows you enjoy now, if there's any comedy that you particularly rate? Well, I think the fact that people still, you can hear laughter. I mean, you haven't got to watch Have I Got News For You or Mock The Week. And there is a terrific amount of laughter around. And I rather miss the fact that Spitting Image isn't there. Because I think the Spitting Image puppets will have the most wonderful time at the moment. Uh, and I'm not sure whether that's because there's a sort of censorship of these ideas. I don't think so. I just think it probably costs too much. Um, 
uh, spitting image, but it was wonderful. So, I mean, yes, people will laugh. Uh, I think that, um, yeah, that there is, there's definitely now a feeling that you have to be careful what you laugh about. Um, I don't think it matters so much if you're a stand-up, you're doing little bits here and there, but if it's a, you know, a, a proper sketch show or a comedy show, people will want to know what you're doing, they will want to see scripts beforehand, um, they being, you know, the, the, the powers that be at, at the television companies. We never had that, we were just, someone said, well, we don't know what this is all about, Monty Python, but have a go and come back and see us later. And they put us out very late on a, on a Saturday night, um, hoping that no one would see it. But they didn't interfere with us at all. And I think now there'll be much more vigilance. And of course, people would go through and they would, they would just make sure that you're PC here and there, or you were aware that things had to be PC. It's quite hard to be anti-PC these days, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which is probably, it's probably needed, but people are sensitive. Um, and people have always been sensitive, but uh, somehow I think the um, uh, social media has given a platform to people to be as violently angry uh, as they as they want as they might feel by anything. They're, they're, it's a, it's an anger which creates and spreads very very quickly. And I think television companies and people like that are aware um, that this is not. A good thing to be, you know, de dealing with that, especially as so much of our television now is dependent on selling things, and you know, it's the same thing as used to be in America. Um, Python would never have gone in America because um, you wouldn't be able to sell anything uh, with a program like Python. You know, people would be sort of un very uncomfortable with it, and you know, television is about advertising. That's how. It, keeps going and um, so I think that in a sense we have to tread much more carefully now. But Python was very popular in America I remember reading in one of your books that you'd said that you didn't really feel you were successful or know how successful it was until you went to the States which thinking about the present situation is quite interesting but it was huge wasn't it uh, you were you were well, huge in America. Well what happened was it, it failed in America um, for the first I think it was 1970 we did Python, we had two series. 1972, 73, we tried Search to America, it didn't work. Um, and what made it work in the end was that it went out on non-commercial television, went on public broadcasting circuit. And public broadcasting was watched largely by um, disaffected students and people like that and graduates. And it spread very, very quickly around the campuses of America. That's what that's what saved Python in America. But it was the fact that we were we found a home in a non on non-commercial, the only non-commercial station in America. Oh, interesting. That's very interesting. Okay, gosh, there's so much I can say, but I'm 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 just keeping my slight eye on the time. And I think we've probably got time for a couple more questions. So audience, actually there's lots coming up already. But finally, um <laughs> Your life journey has been a very interesting one from a radical anti-establishment performer. You're a bit more of an establishment figure now and you were knighted last year. One could say you're a national treasure, Michael. Do you feel like a member of the establishment or do you still have the old disruptor in you? Yes, I still have the old disruptor. It's there <laughs> on the surface. I was never a great, I was never a great radical. Um, I, I loved things that were different and new and I what made me laugh and what excited me, whether it was reading books or watching shows, was something unusual, something I'd not seen before. I've always been rather resist, I've always resisted the sort of crowd urge to look at things which everybody loves. Well, yeah, I want, I want, a, I want a little twist on that. I want to see something with a bit of an edge, which is why I sort of loved watching John Cleese acting and all that, because here was this very tall man who looked like a bank manager and could be incredibly sort of icily sort of dismissive um, and I thought that was that now that interested me so I suppose that was you know that was slightly different <laughs> that was a sort of disruptive um, urge and, and I, I, I've always liked uh, things that not not in, not over you know not revolutionary but are definitely questioning um, the establishment and the accepted view I think once it's an accepted view, 
I kind of want to find another view. <laughs> very, good, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, that's that's a wonderful point um, to end on. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, well, I could I could have talked to you for ages, but I know that other people want to talk to you. Uh, well, thank um, you. Very nice. So, thank yeah. you. That was absolutely wonderful. So, um, just let me address the audience. Audience, you should see a Q and A tab on your screen. Please feel free to type your questions on the window, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, now, I've got some coming in as well. Uh, a question from Matt. Um, your diaries seem to show a very hard work ethic over many decades. What drives you to work so hard? Well, you know, I was brought up in a sort of you know, English middle class family. My father was uh, uh, was brought up to work hard. His father was a, a hard working Norfolk doctor. Um, his father was a vicar. So, you know, so they were all very much, um, you have to fill your days. Um, but it, it's funny, I mean, I, I, I said, born and brought up in Sheffield, and so much seemed to be happening outside Sheffield. <laughs> I didn't, I'm not putting the city down at all. It's a, it's a great place, actually. And there's lots going on at the moment. But it, it was always this, this feeling, as I think I said to Louisa earlier, um, I wanted to look for the road le less travelled. And that, um, that meant, you know, working hard all the time. I mean, educationally, everything was down to exams, exams to get from one school to a better school and then to university. And this required, this required sort of a, a, a work ethic of, of turning up and doing things. Um, and, and I was quite sort of happy with that. I don't like sort of wasting time. No, interesting. Um, Grace says, of all the places you've visited, which has changed the most? Oh, that's interesting. Probably I would say China. When I first went to China, it was rather like North Korea is now, with a lot of people working in the fields with very simple tools, no machinery, no technological equipment. Um, everything looking rather sort of bare and bleak. And China was, I remember, was like that when I went there in the 1980s. And of course, everyone was in sort of Maoist, um, cost, uh, Ma Maoist clothes and boiler suit clothes and all that sort of stuff. And now, of course, China is indistinguishable almost from any city in America, for instance. Tall blocks, people going around, a lot of cars rather than bicycles. Um, fashion is very very important everyone everyone is looking very very western as opposed to the so the uniform of the Mao era so I, I I think I think definitely China has made the greatest leaps and bounds um, I mean physically just in the, the the buildings and the cities and the way they look but also um, in the people themselves you know that they, they they all people like to look different and you know, when I first went there, they all had to look the same. Interesting, interesting. Now, this is one from Ruth. Did you have any moments in your travels when you were in real danger? Um, yes, yes, there were, there were one or two. I, mean, <laughs> I thought I was in real danger um, on two rapids. One was in the Zambezi, where we, I learnt whitewater rafting on probably most, one of the most dangerous stretches of whitewater in the world, just below the Victoria Falls. You know, and I had about, we had 15 minutes instruction and then we hurled down these rapids. I look at the pictures of it now, I disappear. The whole boat just disappears and crashes through these rocks. Um, and I thought, well, never again. And I did it again. And I had to, when we were in, um, in the Urubamba, the headwaters of the Amazon. And the last stretch, when the headwaters become, finally move into the Amazon, pour into the Amazon plain. There's some very, very uh, fierce uh, rapids called the Pongo de Manaik. And um, I, I must say, I, I read a book the night before we were going to go down these rapids by a traveler called Peter Matheson, very good, very good writer. And he said, one of the places I, I, would, you know, I would avoid all costs is the Pongo de Manaik. <laughs> it's too late by then. Uh, but it was it was exhilarating, but I suppose it was yeah it was dangerous. But if I'd said to anybody what I was going to do many times on the journey, people would have said, "Don't, don't do it, don't go there." And yet, when you're there, 
you have to get from A to B, you've got to go. What I never did, I have to say, was bungee jumping. That was silly. That was self-inflicted. I thought, if I, you know, all right, a difficult railway journey, a difficult um, uh, journey in a light plane, difficult journey on a boat, that's fine. But deliberately throwing yourself off a, off a bridge, no thanks. No, very sensible, I think, very sensible. Now, I might ask you this, but you might want a moment to think about it. Gosh, they're coming in thick and fast. Sarah says, of all the people you've met or not, who would you like to have around your table for supper? Um, well, I'd, 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 I'd like to have the Dalai Lama because he's such good, yeah. he's wonderful company. <laughs> yeah. He's very jolly. Um, and uh, you can, he's, the Dalai Lama, despite his sort of eminence, is a humble person and, and he's very easy to talk to. And he's as interested in you as you, you would be in anyone else. So that's what you need when you're mm. around a table. You want to find people interested. Mm. So I would say that. Um, Otherwise, um, there was a, a, um, a lovely man in Chile who looked after us, um, and he, he uh, his parents had been uh, among the disappeared people who'd been seized during the um, you know the the um, uh, the dictatorship there. And he he just had a sort of a great calm about whatever life might bring because of what, he, what he'd been through and I think the people uh, have led some people I've met have led such difficult lives such dangerous lives and the fact they've come through it they have a they either go to pieces completely or they've got a certain calm and a certain wisdom and uh, Patricio Lanfranco had that. Oh, fantastic yeah, very interesting. Now, Neil Pe Pearson is asking oh, where's he gone? For such an inveterate traveller, sorry, how bearable has lockdown been? Fine. I'm. I think I'm. I'm sort of winding down my travelling days, uh, partly because, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting older and, and I've got, we've got four grandchildren now who I love watching grow up. Also, you know, my wife has not been so well recently, so I've, it's been good for me to be at home. Um, and also then, you know, this kind of signal that <laughs> the great finger of fate came down last September and I had to go in and have open heart surgery, um, which is all fine. It's all worked very, very well. My, my loose valves have been, you know, taped up with cellar tape, whatever they do, and they're working fine. But it makes you stop and it makes you think about being away for a long time. And I think I've done the last of the long journeys. So in a sense, lockdown was good because i was actually able to do i mean things like what we're doing now is talking about journeys that i've done reflecting on what i've seen and done if you're not very careful you keep doing you know a book a series and going on and on without stopping and thinking just what have i seen what what what, what was like and i you know I, i've done so much traveling it's nice to stop and look back at it um and you know, relish where I've been, the people I've met, the food I've eaten, and the adventures I've had, and, and rather than sort of forgetting them and rushing onwards. So it's actually been quite good for me, lockdown. I'm getting a bit restless now. <laughs> no, not now, I'm not this minute. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you go in a minute. <laughs> um, uh, David says, any thoughts about sort of leading on from that? Any thoughts on a new destination for your travels? Well, uh, I can't tell you exactly because um, uh, we, we have plans, but they've had to be changed quite a lot. But it's somewhere in the Middle East. And um, because of, we were actually supposed to go last September, um, but I of course had to change that because of my heart uh, operation. And then um, coronavirus made it difficult to go anywhere. So it's a shortish journey, about the same length as North Korea. And um, it, it still sort of, I think, will be hopefully somewhere in the Middle East. And hopefully it will happen early next year. But you just really don't know at the moment. It's, it's so, so difficult. Certainly going to be, you know, it's just, I mean, I'll just be sort of, um, it'll be dreaming, uh, dream travel before that. Okay, okay. 
And Jackie says, do you have any regrets from your career? Um, well, I regret that I never learnt to speak another language well. Oh, I'm just not good at that. And it seems odd to people that I travel a lot. I always say, <laughs> I, get over, I say, well, I go to so many countries. We go to 20 countries in one series. I can't learn all the languages, but I can't even learn one. So, um, you yeah, know, apart from a bit of French, I would like to um, have learnt a language. I very much like to be able to play a musical instrument. Um, and um, apart from that, I think I have a few regrets. I've been very, very fortunate to do and see and experience and enjoy as much as I have, really. I mean, I've far too much, I think, sometimes. I've been spoiled, which is partly what I was saying about stopping and thinking back and, and, and remembering and, and valuing what you've done and what you've seen is quite important. Yeah, absolutely. Lucy has asked, what would you most like to change about the 21st century world? Gosh, these are quite big questions. <laughs> um, yes, well, I, I, I'd like to change the, um, I'd like to change, well, not change exactly, but be aware of the way technology is taking over um, our world and the way uh, so much of our life is now run by people we don't know in places we don't know um, and to whom we entrust enormous amounts of our personal information. I, I'm, 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 I'm sort of, as I grow older, uh, I'm sort of going back to kind of the village <laughs> idea of life. I, I want to know who I'm talking to. I want to know, and we have a lovely local community here in London. Um, and um, I think there's absolutely nothing to beat uh, actual physical human contact talking to somebody um, and I think that we if we're not very careful we're giving so much of our life away to um, systems um, that, are, that are set up to ostensibly make things easier for us I mean not, I, I'm sorry to rant on but nothing makes me more angry than someone something comes up on my computer saying, Michael, we think you will like this. Well, you don't call me Michael. You don't even know who I am. How dare you say I might like this? What I would like is for you to just shut up. <laughs> Sorry, there we are. I mustn't go on anymore, but you get my drift. I quite agree. I quite agree. I quite agree. <laughs> <laughs> I shall get things after this Say, Michael, you will like this. Life of a uh, uh, gr grumpy man. <laughs> Um, now it was sort of related, no, not really. Jenny has asked, what bit of kit do you always take with you when you travel? And Evie has asked, you're a well-known international travellers, but do you have a favourite place in the UK? Ah, but you might not want to tell us that because then everyone will go there. So the, the kit first, maybe. Swiss Army penknife, are you going to say? No. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would say Swiss Army penknife, yes. Uh, and that has been indispensable and get as many blades as you possibly can there's not one that very good for cutting nose hair um, <laughs> <laughs> but, Essential when you're on camera i suppose yes you've got to have everything yeah well yeah but i mean god you kind of have plaits coming out of your hooter <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> i think probably notebook and uh, map and no certainly notebook and pen uh, I, I uh, indispensable. I once had my bag uh, stolen at an airport. Uh, only time in all the eight series we did that I ever lost anything. And oh. they took all my notes on the previous countries I'd been to. And I sat oh. down and I tried to remember what I'd done. And quite extraordinary, an awful lot came back. And in a long day, I was able to reassemble um, nearly all the information I put down, but not absolutely not all of it. So, um, you know, losing the, losing the notebook was, was traumatic. Uh, so that's probably the most precious thing I take. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. And favorite place in the UK? You, you don't have to answer that if you'd rather not. Yeah, no, I can answer that because I, I often people say, where's the, where's, where's the best place in the world um, you go to? And I, I would say uh, Scotland, um, certainly the west coast of Scotland, I think is absolutely um, irresistibly beautiful i mean despite whatever the weather is people say it rains up there but it rains even the rain is spectacular um the islands and uh, what i like about scotland is that it's it's got grandeur in miniature if you see what i mean 
so you can be in one of the two very very wonderful cities Edinburgh or Glasgow and then you know an hour and a half drive you're in uh, peaks and mountains and four hours beyond that you're up in islands and some of the oldest um, rock in the whole world up in the Caithness and all that so uh, it's spectacular it's a bit like sort of an extra um, a luxury version of the Peak District of when I was growing up, you know, if I really feel I want to get away, I go to Scotland and, and, and I know some very good friends in Scotland, um, including the mountaineer Hamish McInnes, who's just been just turned 90, most brilliant, brilliant climber, completely mad, but there we are. <laughs> uh, so yes, I would say, I would say Scotland and probably if you want to tight down to a certain place I would say the Isle of Isla where they make some extraordinary good whiskey which I have a little of every now and then just so oh, oh, now we know your secret to pull okay yeah <laughs> um, now this is rather lovely Humphrey age 17 asked which country apart from the UK has laughed the loudest watching Monty Python Oh gosh, that's good. I that's how you're meant to know good. that if you have a laughometer, but anyway. Um. Yeah. Well, you you will find that there are certain anomalies here. Like, like uh, we've always brought up to uh, rather patronisingly see the Germans as having absolutely no sense of humour, and yet the Germans absolutely love Monty Python. So you know, uh, <laughs> I have to say, good for them. And I've heard them laugh uh, very very loudly. Um, I, th I thought one of the countries in Europe have from the best sense of humour is, is the Czech Republic. I don't quite know why, but I think it's because they've, they're quite a small country in the middle of bigger countries and they've had to sort of, you know, they can't, they can't sort of invade other countries, they can't take over other countries. Um, so they, they have a nice sense of their own, so they can laugh at themselves uh, as well as being very civilised and, and nice, in, you know, it's a lovely place to be. But they, I think the key is to be able to laugh at yourself, um, which I think that, that the Czechs do do very well, rather like the Brits. Yeah. Uh, whereas I think the French have slightly more difficulty with that. Just slightly. But I think it's a lovely country. Um, I think this will probably be our, our last uh, question, but of, of previous travellers and or explorers from the past, who are your greatest heroes and why? And can I just say, I know one of them is, Scott, and there was rather a lovely story when you were filming, I don't know if it was the North or the South Pole, sorry, I should know that, but there was a wonderful story about a piece you gave to camera and your oh, yes. the cameraman said to you, yeah, maybe we could end up, because that was rather lovely. Anyway. Yes, well, that was, that was uh, at the end of um, Pole to Pole. We were actually at, all, well, at the South Pole, which should have been very exciting, but it was, it was rather dull because it's just a big work site and the sort of trucks and all that sort of thing and and it's very very cold and very bleak but I had to do a, a summing up of the whole journey and you know been sort of eight episodes and I'd worked on it in the tent you know quite hard sort of thinking about what I was going to say and I put all I could into it now I was told by the cameraman look it's minus 50 the cameras probably only do one take before freezing up. You've got to get it right. So no panic there. And I did it and I got it absolutely perfectly right. Then I, the sound man was sort of looking at me as though um, he had a slight sort of grin on his face. And he said, you might want to do that again. I said, do that again? You know, we're at the South Pole. Let's get in the tent and get warm. He said, no, well, have a listen. And he made me listen to what I'd said. And, and yes, there was one bit where I said rather, you know, I just got the emphasis wrong. I said, as a schoolboy in Sheffield, um, I used to read about the adventures of Scott and Amundsen under the bedclothes at night. And it just sounded as though Scott and Amundsen were under the bedclothes rather than me. And it was a silly thing. And he, you know, I said, oh, yes, all right, I'll do it again. And, uh, uh, and from then on, I had to do about seven takes because it's terrible. Once you do one good take and it's not quite right, you fall apart. But that was it. Scott and Amundsen remain two of the, the great great explorers but I think they've been superseded now by by Shackleton and uh, and um, James Clark Ross who took the Erebus down to the Antarctic in 1839. Right. Okay. Great great exploration. Well 
that was absolutely wonderful. I think we'll end on that one. Michael, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Great pleasure. Uh, Keep up the good work. No, well, it was wonderful. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Book Aid International, for hosting this event, the UK's leading book donation and library development charity.